The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, gave us the first ever episode fully written by Denai Guerrero, packed with drama and a conclusion to the show's second act. BD here, and in this video, we're going to be breaking down episode four of The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, with everything you might have missed, exclusive insights from the cast, and a review score out of 10 at the end of the video. So subscribe to the comicbook.com YouTube channel, hit the thumbs up, share this video with a TWD family friend, and let's jump in. The episode opens to the tune of Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree, a smash hit song from 1973, and this is a song about a man returning home from war, wondering if his sweetheart waited for him while he was away, and he's writing letters to ask just that. This clearly ties to the story of Rick and Michonne, as Rick shows throughout this episode and this entire series so far that he is committed to a war at and within the CRM, very much like a real-world soldier. Not unlike having to go to war and following orders, even if you don't necessarily agree with them yourself, but you're doing what you believe is best to protect a cause greater than yourself. Rick's call a copter button is presented to him, and we remember this button from episode three because it can summon a CRM helicopter within 300 miles. Michonne reveals Ramona the pest from a shelf. The story is about a young girl being old enough to ride the bus by herself, maybe kind of reflecting the story of Michonne or Rick or their kids growing up and being more independent. More importantly, Michonne tells Rick about RJ for the first time, the child she was pregnant with when Rick left Alexandria back in season nine of The Walking Dead. She reveals that RJ is almost eight years old already, a reminder to all of us just how deep into the apocalyptic story these two and the whole Walking Dead franchise is at this point, and how long it's been since Rick blew that bridge and left Alexandria. Rick and Michonne put on some excellent performances during an argument, and double props to the Nigerira for this entire bit, considering she also wrote this episode, marking the first time she's written an episode in the Walking Dead franchise, and I'm not at all surprised that this scene and so many others often feel like a stage play playing out right here on our screens, with extended sequences and dramatic dialogue bits, considering Guerrero herself is an accomplished playwright. And Gimple did, was like, she's the showrunner of that episode, don't come talk to me. And so I was, I was like the point person uh, for the episode, which allowed me to have a vision on it, but I had to be, out. it was very collaborative. They were reading every draft, they were, you know, giving their thoughts, their notes, and, um, and also the episode before it, you know, was being tweaked. And as that tweaks, I have to tweak because they have to work together. So it's a process. But ultimately, um, I, I, I loved what um, what I what what it came to be. And then I was, you know, I was in charge of the post of it as well, of the wow. you know, with the editor and and um, the amazing Michael Slovis was the director. And he did an incredible job with, um, you know, you're, you're, it's interesting explaining, you know, like it's such a familiar story, but I was explaining a very different chapter of it to people like in a way that was like, it hadn't been, we hadn't explored these narratives as a whole for the series. And this episode was definitely a part of that. So it was, it was great. It was very collaborative. It was also very solitary and, um, and um, yeah, then very little sleep. Michonne comes up with a plan to eliminate the threats threatening them, suggesting they kill Jadis and destroy her evidence before leaving the CRM. Rick, on the other and only hand, if you get that one, isn't on board with that. Michonne tells Rick about RJ calling Rick the brave man, something which started when Judith told him the stories about their father, who he's never met, back in season 10 of The Walking Dead. Michonne can't take it anymore. She stops wasting her time and she leaves and Rick is not going with her. He is definitely not going with her. He is not gonna open that door and go, uh, oh yeah, yeah, no, he definitely is going with her. And so is the big old helicopter that makes the building go boom. This would likely have followed the crash, not the call a chopper button, which remains unpushed and is a story point because that shows Rick could have pushed that button all along if he really wanted to go back to the CRM, but he hasn't because he's really actually torn despite putting on this front that he really wants to do his duty at the CRM. A note they find in the complex gym explains how this place kept its electricity. It's a self-sustaining building for the Greenwood Project, which had a founder who tried to keep the place going as long as possible. It's a mirror to Rick and his thought of being able to change the CRM and Michonne points that out directly, trying to convince him that he can't do this alone or he will end up just like that once zombie corpse thing on the ground. Ultimately, Rick and Michonne fight their way out into a hallway that looks a lot like the hallway from the hospital where Rick woke up in the first episode of The Walking Dead, but kind of like if it were having like a red and blue rave. They make it out and they're making out, leading to one of the very few sex scenes ever to take place in the entire Walking Dead franchise, despite a lot of couples having been on the show along the way. You gotta wonder, what are they gonna do when they have a third on the way, hmm? 
Rick is startled to see the Roomba vacuuming the room, so Michonne explains what it is and says she got one just before the end of the world. This might indicate the difference in these two's lives pre-apocalypse. Michonne was well off and organized, having things like Roombas cleaning her living space, while Rick was a police officer in Georgia making a bit of a more modest living and being too focused on his work and getting in fights with his family as a result. Seems like some things might just never change with this guy. Michonne starts to understand Rick's dilemma and even embraces his arm missing the hand, which for the most part, the show shoots around and tries to avoid having it in the frame when he doesn't have the fake hand cover on. You'll even notice in this scene, Michonne's head blocks the arm in a shot afterwards, and his hand is out of the frame when Andrew Lincoln is standing up, which is likely a move to save money and time on VFX to get these episodes done. Rick reveals that the CRM took his dreams from him over time, making him forget about Coral, and eventually Michonne and his dreams too. This all leads to Rick deciding to stay with Michonne, thus concluding the second act of this six episode series and sending us into the final two episodes for the third act. They fight their way out and Michonne is using a piece of metal rebar. Shockingly, no reference to the fact that Rick was impaled by one of those very same items before he left Alexandria, right when he fell off a horse, but these two are definitely back on the horse, if you know what I mean. Now let's review it on a scale of one to Rick and Michonne's newfound sex life. This episode is quite a ride. I think it's one of the best episodes of The Ones Who Live so far, and I love the fact that the Nigari wrote it, and I think she really used her strengths with the stage play background in this show. It really dials in the differences between Rick and Michonne's perspectives, with Rick leaning so far into protecting his people from the CRM and doing what needs to be done, and Michonne wanting to go back to Alexandria for an opportunity at living together, even if it means in bliss, and not worrying about Philadelphia. The performances in this episode were fantastic. The moment where Michonne puts the phone with Carl carved into it into Rick's hand with the cuts of Rick and Carl together in the past spliced in there was very emotionally powerful. I think it was terribly convenient that the car Rick and Michonne found and they are driving back to Alexandria was loaded with gas in its back seat, but whatever, we're just going to give that one a pass. Though I do wonder where that road is going to take them and us with only two episodes left and no return trip to the CRM in sight. Certainly, it's not going to be that easy to just return home, but we will see in the next couple of weeks. Overall, I give this episode a 9 out of 10, and I cannot wait to see what's next. What did you think of The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, Episode 4? Share your thoughts in the comments section, and subscribe to the comicbook.com channel on YouTube for more videos like this one, exclusive interviews, and more. I'm BD. I'll see you there.